In April 2006, CNN reported that the president's personal airplane had been interfered with. Graffiti artist Mark Echo had apparently sprayed the words still free across Air Force One in order to make a political statement, but also to advertise the new video game he was launching. Mark Echo is the founder of Echo Unlimited Clothing and Complex Magazine, turned into Complex Media later on, and his story began shortly before he was born. In 1972, Mark's mother was pregnant with his older sister Marcy. She could feel kicking in her lower abdomen and kicking further toward her chest. When she informed the doctor about this, she was told that there was an echo in the fluid. Then on August 29th, his mother went into labor at St. Barnabas Hospital in New Jersey. She gave birth to Marcy, but then realized that something was still in there. The doctor called for a second bassinet and told her, here comes the echo. He was born Mark Malkowski, and Echo started off as a nickname. At school, Mark wasn't exactly the most popular kid in class. In fifth grade, he was playing football at school, and when the ball came towards him, it slipped through his hands. A voice from behind him said, good catch, fatty. When he saw who was making this taunt, he felt a lump in his throat. It was from a kid who was much bigger than him, and his description of Mark as a fatty was cruel but accurate. As he moved closer toward him, his insults got closer to the bone. He asked him if he was Jewish and asked him where his beanie and curly things were. He then said that he was going to steal his bike. And for Mark, this was simply a battle that he wasn't going to win. So he's prepared to take the beating and lose his bike. However, someone came running to his defense. His sister Marcy came forward and said, quote, That's my twin brother, and you better back off. The bully laughed at the fact that a girl was coming to his defense but then realized that she was dead serious. He was rattled by the fact that a girl was squaring up to him, and he backed off. Despite coming out of the womb minutes before Mark, Marcy took on the role of the elder sibling with confidence. Marcy and Mark were twins, but they were also inseparable from their neighborhood friend, Darren Robinson, who they saw as their honorary triplet. They loved playing video games together, but a huge turning point in Mark's life was when he was introduced to Darren's father's record collection, he was simply mesmerized by the artwork on covers of records by James Brown and Al Jarreau. He also had the same fascination with his father's comic book collection and started tracing some of the illustrations. It was then that he found his first calling, drawing. After religiously tracing illustrations from comic books, he created drawings of his own. These new artworks were soon on display on his grandma's refrigerator. But there was one big problem. Mark was overweight. He was bad at sports, and he loved drawing and playing video games. In New Jersey, in the 80s, all of these attributes pointed towards someone who was nerdy and far from cool, and he desperately wanted to reinvent himself. But this all changed when he went to visit his cousin in Trenton, New Jersey. Within this urban area of New Jersey, the walls were covered in artwork. When he asked his dad what that was, he shrugged and said it was graffiti. Mark was intrigued and later bought the book Subway Art by Henry Chalfant and Martha Coop which documented the graffiti work spreading all across greater New York. These people were drawing and creating art, but not in a nerdy way. They were part of a movement known as hip-hop. As you probably know, there are four elements of hip-hop. The DJ, the MC, breakdancing, and graffiti. Mark recalled this moment in his autobiography and wrote, Well, I couldn't rap. I couldn't MC. I was too fat to breakdance, but I could draw my ass off. For a fifth grade art competition, he drew a picture of Michael Jackson sitting on a throne. Not only did it win first prize, but it also impressed the bully that tried to steal his bike too. His initial tag name was Cram, which was Mark spelled backwards, but this was then replaced with his nickname before he was born, Echo. When Mark was 12, he bought a copy of Black Bee magazine. On the cover was LL Cool J, who wore a sweatshirt with an airbrushed photo of himself on it. Mark learned that this shirt was made by a group of guys called Shirt Kings in Queens, New York. For Mark, this was a light bulb moment. So while eating turkey at Thanksgiving dinner, Mark interrupted the conversation and asked for an airbrush and a compressor. He explained that it would pay for itself as he could use it to sell t-shirts in school. Like many parents, they figured that this was a phase and these tools would soon be gathering dust in the garage a few months later. He presented the magazine to his father and said, this is hip hop, I love hip hop. This is what we wear in hip-hop. You can't get this in Lakewood. After all, Shirt Kings are out at Kings Plaza in Jamaica, Queens. No one makes this in Lakewood. I could fill that gap. I can't. 
so his parents cashed out his bar mitzvah money and bought the equipment. Mark Echo's first business was in his parents' garage. He spent hours upon hours until he got good at it. And when he was finally ready to release some t-shirts out into the world, he gave them away for free. He knew that this would help get the word out. The people wearing his designs became walking advertisements for his business. He then wore his own t-shirts and even mimicked LL Cool J by wearing a sweatshirt with an illustration of his own face on it. He realized that this was something only LL Cool J could really pull off. His first sale came from a girl who wanted him to draw a palm tree on a shirt. This got the ball rolling, and he started selling shirts here and there. Before he knew it, he had earned back his bar mitzvah money and called his company Echo Airbrushing. Despite the success, he was still, like many teenagers, very concerned about his appearance. The summer before his sophomore year in high school, he spent the whole day airbrushing and eating nothing but tuna. He lost 50 pounds and had his own business, so his ability to speak to girls at school finally seemed like a tangible reality. And soon enough, he had the perfect icebreaker to talk to girls. Echo Airbrushing branched out from making t-shirts to painting fingernails. As his business continued to grow, so did his connections. That being said, he was still not making huge amounts of money and still got a part-time job at Kmart. But it was while working at this job that he met a guy named Chance, who sold weed, but also wanted to help sell some of his t-shirts. He had connections further out in New Jersey in areas like Lakewood, Newark, and East Orange. His business network suddenly got even wider. At the same time, his parents both worked in real estate, and the market had just imploded. They wanted their son to get a steady and stable job, so Mark enrolled in Rutgers University Pharmacy School. This was where his father studied, and this provided a guaranteed salary of around $60,000. He'd have to paint a lot of fingernails to make anywhere close to that kind of money. Despite his transformation throughout his school years, he still found himself unpopular again in fraternity. He loved hip-hop culture and embraced this in how he talked and how he dressed. Hip-hop was far from mainstream at this stage, and wearing baggy clothes and listening to hip-hop was at odds with many of his classmates. His white peers thought he was trying to be black, and his black classmates felt that he might even be imitating or mocking them. And to leave the frat house, he did something pretty terrible. In Mark's autobiography, he decided to tell his life story, warts and all, and this is perhaps the worst thing he's done in his life. Around that time, his mother suffered from alopecia and had naturally thinning hair. To give himself an excuse to leave, he told everyone that his mom had cancer, and because of this, everyone was much nicer to him. It's not something he's proud of and was a cheap trick to get himself out of there. In his sophomore year, he had his own dorm to himself, this meant that he could draw to his heart's content. He was up until the wee hours of the morning drawing pictures, one of which explained his identity crisis that he was facing. One showed him on the subway wearing urban streetwear. On one side, a white woman is terrified of his image. On the other side, a black person is angered by him appropriating his culture. He then turned his dorm into an art showroom and sold some of his artwork. He ended up making $500 in a weekend. Also this year, he befriended a guy named Kale Brock. Kale wanted to become an R&B singer and wasn't afraid to say it out loud either. For Mark, he was a kindred spirit. He finally met someone with the same level of drive and ambition as himself. Kale wasn't just talking about being something big, but actually taking steps to become one. And both of them started actively pursuing their journey to fulfill their dreams. In the pre-internet age, both Kale and Mark had limited access to breaking into their industries. What they decided to do was send promo and materials to the people that inspired them. One of Mark's first steps was to simply mail out specifically tailored designs to his favorite music groups. And one of the first names on his list was Cool DJ Red Alert. If you wanted to find out about hip hop during this time, you needed to tune into Red Alert's show on the New York radio station 98.7. And on his radio show, he would have shout outs. He was a man who wielded enormous power and Mark sent him some of his artwork and clothing, hoping for a shout out. So Red Alert's mail and fax machine were spammed by Mark Echo. He was not expecting a response, but it was his way of taking action to accomplish his dream. Then one day, while listening to Red Alert, he hears the immortal words, I gotta shout out my man Echo for blessing me with this fly gear. Yo, he got the fresh airbrush jacket, the crazy snapback hats, my man Echo airbrushing. Yeah, yeah, big up Lakewood, New Jersey, and my man Echo. Our work is crazy. Soon, the likes of Public Enemy's Chuck D, Q-Tip, KRS-One, were all receiving designs from Echo Airbrushing in their mailbox. Kel Brock was doing the same and wanted to send one of his mixtapes to Michael Bivens, 
who was an R&B artist who had also turned to management and had recently skyrocketed the group Boys to Men into stardom. He would often tell people to sing for them right in front of him and then decided immediately on whether to sign them. Mark and Kale chose to contact Biff together, so he would receive some artwork from Mark and demo tape from Kale in the same package. Biv was part of a group known as Bell Biv DeVoe, who were performing a concert in Holmdale, New Jersey at the Garden State Arts Center. While it's easy to ignore things that come through a letterbox or a fax machine, they figured that handing to him in person meant that little bit extra. This was a make or break moment for Mark, but he was soon sent to hospital. He had dislocated his shoulder, so Kale had to go at it alone. Luckily, Mark's older sister Sherry was at the front of the crowd and managed to hand it to Biv while he was performing on stage. Then one night, at 3 o'clock in the morning, Mark's phone rings. Yo, is this Mark? This is Biv. Hi. Um, yeah, this is. I want to hook up with your man Kale. Tell him to be at the Sheraton in Red Bank in 30 minutes. Mark called Kale and made sure he went for it. Kale chose to lose some sleep over losing out on a great opportunity, and thankfully, Biv signed Kale to his new record label. Getting signed was a dream come true for Kale, but it also opened a lot of doors for Mark too. When Biv was holding one of his star-studded parties, Kale would invite Mark along. Mark remembers he was first invited to a party in New York City. Red Alert was DJing, and Mark made a fool of himself in front of the actress Rosie Perez. And on the other side of the room, he saw a slickly dressed man who, if he wasn't famous, he certainly acted like he was. When he asked Kale who he was, he said that was Puffy a guy who had just produced a Mary J. Blige album. Mark was mixing with the stars, but also studying at Rutgers Pharmacy School. He realized that Bivens was his ticket out of Rutgers and devised a business plan to propose to him. Around this time, Russell Simmons, and then CEO of Def Jam, was also running a $100 million clothing line called Fat Farm. Hip-hop-inspired clothing was an emerging market with enormous potential. So that summer in 1992, Mark spent an entire summer back at his parents' garage thinking of a business plan. During that time, an old school friend introduced him to Seth Gersberg, who was investing in local businesses and was also their age. The fact that someone their age had earned the capital to invest in companies is something that intrigued Mark. Seth turned up to his house, driving a red Mustang with Bruce Springsteen blaring out from his speakers. He was initially impressed with the artwork, but when he asked Mark about his cash flow projections and evaluation, he might as well have been speaking in a different language. Mark got defensive and explained that it was all about the art. For whatever reason, he got a pretty bad vibe off and told Seth, I'll get back to you, but never did. However, Bivens did not buy into his plan, and instead of organizing a meeting with Bivens, he had an urgent meeting with the school dean, John Cagliazzi. He pointed out his poor grades, but also praised Mark for some of his artwork, which hung in the school's lobby. He asked him what he really wanted to do. So Mark leveled with him and told him about his company and how it was struggling. The dean said that he didn't want to be 40 years old and realizing it was too late. He should pursue his dreams. So they came up with a compromise. They devised a less intensive timetable that allowed him to continue his degree, but also his business. And because the deal with Bivens was now down the drain, Mark basically had to swallow his pride and get back to Seth. Seth drove back to his house and handed him a literal bag full of cash, consisting of $5,000 worth of $20 bills. The plan was to flip this 5,000 into 50 million. And if the bag full of cash wasn't suspicious enough, Mark was asked to visit a factory in Brooklyn and ask for a guy named Big Phil. At this factory, Mark shadowed a guy named Bodie for a couple of weeks until he knew how to use the machines they used to make t-shirts. While working, he caught a glimpse into just how sketchy the area he found himself in. The factory looked onto Gowanus Bay, and every day at exactly 1 p.m., police officers brought prostitutes out to the abandoned piers to use their services. And no matter how hard he tried, the t-shirts were of poor quality. The technology available produced low-quality shirts and was not something Mark wanted to release as his product, and moving it to a better factory would have cost him another 5,000 that he didn't have. Eventually, Mark found a way of making t-shirts he was happy with using the tools he had available. However, this was an incredibly laborious and tedious process. It wasn't ideal, but he finally had his first mass-produced t-shirt made called Powerful Potion. Luckily, the first summer this shirt was sold, and managed to shift 50,000 units. Ultimately, the elaborate designs Mark wanted to make were not suited to the technology he had, and using different tools would have added $12 to the market price, and the company was barely scraping by. 
advertisements appeared in the hip-hop magazine The Source, as well as the skateboarding magazine Thrasher. On these advertisements was a 1-800 number, which went straight to Mark's apartment. The calls came in, and their products sold well in mom-and-pop stores. But Mark's dream was to have his clothing sold in major department stores like Macy's. To do this, they needed to be mass-produced. And to be mass-produced, they needed lots and lots of capital. So Seth contacted investors who injected money into the company, and in exchange, took a 40% cut of the company. The remaining 60 went half and half to Mark and Seth. And Echo Airbrushing was given a new name. Mark noticed that a lot of companies from the UK had the word limited after their name to explain their partnership structure. For his company, he decided to call it Echo Unlimited. Soon, the company had its first ever employee, Mitch. Sadly, this didn't turn out too well, and Mitch ended up taking out a, quote, $3,000 loan without telling anybody. Seth and Mark decided that they needed someone they could trust. In 1972, Marcy and Mark both spent time together as twins in their mother's womb. Over two decades later, they were now sharing a slightly more spacious apartment in New Brunswick. Marcy was currently studying to become a teacher at Rutgers University, but her brother had other ideas. Mark begged her to join their organization, and she became an equal partner with Seth and Mark. With her help, the company continued to stagger onward and was much more organized. They also traveled to various trade shows across the US in hopes of finding big buyers. But in the long run, their model wasn't sustainable. They needed brand new technology or they faced going bust. Then, at one San Diego trade show, they had a retailer next to them named Eighth Day, which was named after the joke that on the eighth day God created weed. There were countless stereotypes about marijuana users being lazy and unprofessional, but Mark was taken aback at how high quality and professional their shirts were. Mark introduced himself to their owner, who was an incredibly laid-back guy named Drew. Mark was dumbfounded at how he managed to make such high-quality shirts. It was only 94, and Drew basically explained to him what Photoshop was. He told Mark to come to his house in Tahoe, and after a week he should be able to use this technology for his business. In return, Mark promised to bring him the best weed in all of New York. Photoshop was a breakthrough moment, and it was around this time that they needed a more memorable logo. They needed their own Nike swoosh, something that people could instantly associate with Echo. Mark thought back to where it all began, his parents' garage. Inside this garage were wooden rhinos which he used to play with as a kid, and eventually he drew up the rhino logo of Echo Unlimited. At first, people hated it, some thought it was a dinosaur, others thought it was a hippo. The people that did know it was a rhino assumed that they were a hunting brand or had something to do with the outdoors. But bit by bit, the company got more and more orders, and the rhino and Echo were synonymous. And at another convention, Mark bumped into another individual who would change his company forever. Wu was from Taiwan and was selling high-quality jackets. Mark was impressed by the fabrics and asked who made them. He told them he made them in a factory in Hong Kong. Wu and Mark then did a deal. Wu would pay for the raw materials and make his clothes in Hong Kong. He'll ship them to his California warehouse. All Mark had to look after was the marketing. The profits would then be shared 50-50. Mark could not believe the incredible deal he was now doing. At this early stage of their company, their marketing was incredibly simple. In 1995, they hired some of the hottest rappers around that time to promote their brand. Common performed at their trade show in San Diego, and they had The Roots performing for them in Las Vegas. The Echo brand also had advertisements featuring Q-Tip, Busta Rhymes, and KRS-One. Echo gave the impression that they were a thriving and financially healthy company, but this was far from reality. The truth was that the company was quickly running up its debt. Mark maxed out on his credit card, then on his second, then on a third, and a fourth. Seth maxed out on his own too, followed by a second, third, and fourth. When a photographer needed pay for her expenses, they had no money for petty cash, and they instead asked her to use her own credit card with the promise that she would be paid back. A lot of the higher earning staff were also asked to offer up their personal cards to keep the company afloat too. They were all promised that they would be paid back. Mark explained that they were an $8 million company, but were spending as if they were a $20 million company. It was an incredibly risky game they were playing, but their new deal with Wu was sure to bring in much more money. It got to the stage where, one day, all of the lights went out in their office. They hadn't paid their bill in six months, so the electric company had no option but to switch things off. Around this time, David Mays, the publisher of The Source, called Mark on the phone looking for his advertising money and said, You're 180 days late. I like you, but you're effing up my money. 
Everything was counting on this new deal with Wu. But rather frustratingly, Wu was late with his shipments and charged higher prices than they had initially agreed upon. Then, when it looked like things couldn't get any worse, they received an unexpected fax. It was a cease and desist letter. It was from another company called Echo that made scarves. The business was founded by a man named Edgar C. Hyman, who took his initials, ECH, and added an O at the end to come up with the name. They owned the trademark for Echo, and according to their lawyers, Mark's clothing company was creating confusion in the market. Mark was advised by his lawyer that he could have a bigger claim to the name Echo if he changed his name. He was told to change his name to Mark Echo in the same way that Ralph Lifshitz had changed his name to Ralph Lauren. So Mark Malkowski became Mark Echo. But this was not enough. To create less confusion, the Echo brand needed to be changed from ECHO to ECKO. And luckily, nobody noticed the difference. At the end of the day, people associated Echo with the Rhino more than the name. But this led to the rather confusing end result that Mark Echo, spelled E-C-H-O, was the owner of Echo, spelled E-C-K-O. So he legally changed his name again to match the brand. And rather interestingly, Echo had received a second fax. It was from a subcontractor of Wu's. The fax was addressed to Wu and looked as if they had sent it to them by mistake. Interestingly, the prices were much lower than Wu had quoted them. Wu had essentially been dishonest about his prices. Mark believes that this fax was no accident and the subcontractor was letting them know and had pretended to make a mistake. In response, Echo adopted a Zero Dark Thirty approach. They went to Wu's warehouse, told security they had a big order to fill, and basically hauled all of their stuff back. They learned that Wu didn't actually own any of these factories. Instead, he was using a Vegas-based financier to fund all of the operations. And to strike up a deal with the financier in Vegas, he used Echo as collateral. If Wu couldn't pay them back, the financier owed them Echo products. As they found out in a messy court case, they had to provide the Vegas financier with $2 million worth of Echo products. This case, as well as the trademark case that preceded it, were incredibly costly. This, coupled with the mountains of debt that they had already built up, had the potential to bury the company. The company's books were in nightmarish shape, but they had a hugely popular brand that was tapping into the increasingly relevant hip-hop market. The only realistic scenario from here on was to get a bigger brand to take over the company. However, a common theme emerged. These companies were interested in the brand, but when they did their due diligence and saw how much debt they were in, they decided to pull out. The only grain of hope was a man named Alan Finkelman, who was a third cousin of Seth, and luckily for them, he saw things a bit differently. His thinking was that although they were $6 million in debt, only $1.5 million was due immediately. Allen agreed to take on this debt, but only with a fairly big condition. If they can't pay this debt back in three years, the debt turns into equity, meaning that Finkelman would own the company. But Finkelman also helped get them into shape. One of the most important things he asked was what was their core product? This resulted in a light bulb moment where he realized that the Con Peak Mesh short sleeve shirt was the most profitable product and that they should build the brand off that product. This shirt was what the Nike Air Max was to Nike, or what the Polo T-shirt was to Ralph. It was their biggest seller, so they should prioritize this product. Echo's previous marketing techniques around this time got a little bit more inventive. For one promotion, they hired people to put stickers all over the Las Vegas Strip with Where's Echo written across. They also got Fred Durst from Limp Bizkit to promote their shoes, but in a more innovative way. Fred told them, look, I love Echo, but I hate these shoes. F that, I'm not wearing them in your ad. And their response was, how do you feel about blowtorches? Essentially, their advertisement contained Fred Durst setting fire to the shoes and drew a lot more attention to the shoes than him simply wearing them. They also started licensing their products. Seth was at an airport in Odessa in Ukraine and saw a selection of guest watches, which Guess worked on in partnership with Timex. Timex was simply making watches for them and slapping their logos on them, which meant that their products could be sold as far away as Ukraine. They wanted a piece of that action and started licensing some of their products. Mark also started his own magazine. He wanted a magazine that exemplified who he was and many other people. Thrasher magazine was for skaters, The Source was for hip-hop heads, and Rolling Stone was for rock fans. For Echo, things were a bit more complex, and this was how Complex Magazine was born. The magazine was initially called Climate, but they learned from their mistakes and realized that they might get sued with that name. The magazine would never advertise Echo products, 
but would promote the values and lifestyle associated with the Echo brand. Alan Kess, who launched the hip-hop and street culture magazine Stress, was brought in to help. Their first issue arrived in 2002 and contained a picture of Nas and the actor who played Junior in The Sopranos. They also branched out with the design of a video game named Getting Up, which featured a graffiti artist named Train who had to navigate his way through a chaotic and dystopian world. There was also Echo Red, a women's line, and Mark Echo Cut and Sew, a business casual line. They also created another brand named Fizz Sive, which was specifically designed for NFL teams. This product bombed, but the failure of this product was easily offset by the success of other parts of the other business. Ultimately, Echo did not pay off their debt in three years. They did it in 18 months. And Mark was just 29 years old when he became the youngest member of the board of the Council of Fashion Designers of America. But getting advertisements for Complex was more difficult than he expected. The fashion companies they were looking to sell ad pages to were mostly competitors of Echo's and didn't see the appeal of putting money in their rivals' pockets. Also, some of the fashion world were not in touch with what was happening in hip-hop and vice versa. Mark distinctly remembers a fashion executive looking at the cover with a confused face and saying, Who's Connie E. West? A similar situation happened when they met a businessman from Hong Kong, who they were hoping would buy them out. However, the CEO did not believe that Echo was mainstream. Mark's response was simply that Eminem was mainstream and he was hip-hop. A few hours later, Mark learned through a phone call that the deal was off. The Hong Kong businessman did not know who Eminem was and thought he was talking about the candy company. All in all, the company was doing well, but they needed to make a big statement. They needed something which showed they were at the center of the universe. So they decided to have their own flagship store in none other than Times Square. The lease was two million a year, and it would take five years to open the store. It didn't make any sense, but it was a flex. It was a power move. Mark would regularly tell staff, buy an expensive watch you can't really afford. This will make you hungry to grow into it and soon you'll be able to afford five more just like it. In 2005, the CEO of Tommy Hilfiger asked Mark to join him on his yacht. They were sailing down the Hudson River, toward the Statue of Liberty. They sipped champagne and were offered seared tuna. They were presented with an offer, $500 million to buy out Echo Unlimited. While Mark and Seth discussed what to do with the money, they suggested forming another company. Mark suggested calling BOT, B-O-T, which stood for Buy Out Tommy. They would use that money to buy them out. The CEO, Dave Dyer, shook their hands, and Tommy Hilfiger signed the deal. But this wasn't enough. The board of directors killed the deal because they thought it was too cash rich. Mark and Dave were devastated by this, but came to an epiphany. If they wanted to be a company as big as Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren, or Calvin Klein, then Mark needed to step up to the plate. The name Mark Echo needed to breed the same sense of familiarity that came with Tommy, Ralph, and Calvin. He needed to be a household name. In 2005, they got the actor Gary Coleman to conduct a survey. He showed them pictures of four people and asked them which one of them they thought was Mark Echo, the owner of Echo Unlimited. Almost all of them pointed toward the picture of a black guy with dreads, and they almost never pointed at the actual photo of Mark. A plan was put in place titled Mark Echo 2010. This contained goals such as appearing on Time's 100 Most Influential People in the World, owning a sports team, and being photographed with famous celebrities. Marcy at the time was about to have another child, and with the company moving in a completely different direction, it made sense for her to cash in her chips and leave the company. Since Mark Echo was an entrepreneur in hip-hop and fashion, but not a celebrity, he decided to reach out to someone who ticked all of those boxes. Puffy. His excuse to reach out to him was that he needed a soundtrack for his video game Getting Up, and he was also thinking of a video game about a black James Bond character that was based on Puffy. Echo essentially massaged P. Diddy's ego, and a meeting was soon set up. During this meeting, Mark basically told Puffy that he wanted to learn from him. Puffy was not like the businessman in suits he had been talking to. He was eccentric and embodied everything he loved to see in someone successful. When discussing the video game, Puffy jumped up on the table and started doing karate moves to explain what he wanted to look like. In between meetings, Mark could hear him yelling on his cell phone because he wasn't allowed on the red carpet at the Oscars. And of course, Mark got to tag along to some of Puffy's parties. One evening, they arrived at a surprise party for Chris Rock, and everyone accidentally shouted surprise at Puffy and Mark when they arrived. Mark looked across the room and saw Oprah, Jerry Seinfeld, and Eddie Murphy looking at him with confused faces. 
In the summer of 2005, a graffiti block party on Manhattan's 18th Street and 10th Avenue was set to launch Getting Up. But before the event, Mark received a phone call. Their permits for the event were revoked, and the party that had spent a lot of money was shut down by Queens Council. The reason why was because graffiti artists were hired to spray during the event. No public property was going to be defaced, and the graffiti was commissioned art. However, this wasn't enough for Queens City Councilman Peter Vallone Jr. Vallone even got the backing of Mayor Bloomberg, who said, Graffiti is just one of those things that destroys our quality of life. And why anybody thinks that it's funny or cute to encourage kids to do that, I don't know. With the mayor publicly speaking out against the event, their hands were tied. Until Mark's lawyer came up with an idea. What Queen City Council were doing was actually against their First Amendment right to free speech. What's more, by fighting this case, they could make news headlines and create more publicity than their original show had intended. They took their case to court, and the judge said something that highlighted how ludicrous the council was in banning the event. He said, By the same token, presumably, a street performance of Hamlet would be tantamount to encouraging revenge murder. They won the case and made a fool of the mayor of New York. And thanks to the controversy, MTV covered the event, which led to another light bulb moment. If Mark Echo wanted to become a household name, then he needed to be constantly in the newspapers. Echo decided that they would market their brand through pranks and stunts and advertise their company in a way that didn't look like advertising. Instead of paying for an advertisement in a newspaper, they can make the headlines and be the news. In 2006, George W. Bush was an incredibly unpopular president, and their next stunt was to tag Air Force One and spray graffiti on the president's plane. The plan was to spray the words, still free. Their PR agent said that he wanted nothing to do with it. Their lawyer was incredibly concerned, but then relieved when he heard the finer details. They were not actually going to tag Air Force One, but a plane that looked like it. With Google Earth, they could set up a replica of the hangar and the plane. This was in 2006 when the spread of information was a lot slower, and this couldn't be immediately debunked. What's more, YouTube had just started. So the mystery of whether the president's plane was being sprayed by graffiti appearing on primetime CNN, engaging with an audience they could have only dreamed of. Mark Echo became a celebrity and was living a simulated life, carefully orchestrated by his PR team. They would make sure that he would regularly attend clubs and be surrounded by models, even though he was a happily married man. At the 2006 Sundance Film Festival, he was invited to an after-party by Nick Cannon and was now rubbing shoulders with DJ AM, Chameleon Air, Kim Kardashian, and Reggie Bush. He also bumped into the very person he was apprenticed to in this lifestyle, Puffy. He was hanging with a bunch of celebrities, and this was something he could tick off the Mark Echo in 2010 list. Their next marketing gimmick involved a baseball player named Barry Bonds. Bonds was on the cusp of breaking Hank Aaron's career home run record, but it was also alleged that he had been taking performance-enhancing drugs. People were talking about it everywhere, and they needed to get involved. On August 7, 2007, Bonds broke that record, and commenters on ESPN were discussing what should happen with the ball. Mark was watching at a bar and decided that he was going to buy that ball if it went to auction. At a Sotheby's auction in September, the ball was put up for bids. Mark spent $750,000 on a baseball. However, Mark would get that money back through the invaluable publicity it presented him with. They built a website named Vote756.com, where baseball fans could vote on what Mark should do with the ball. There were three options. Option one was to send it to the Hall of Fame. Option two was to send it to the Hall of Fame, but with an asterisk branded on it because he may have been using steroids. And last, but not least, voters had the option to put it on a rocket and blast it into space. 10 million people voted, and the winning option was to send it to the Hall of Fame with an asterisk. While all of this was happening, the banks were concerned about his finances. Seth realized that they had to close down the Times Square store. The 2008 crash happened and the financial markets collapsed, causing devastation to almost every business around the world. Mark was now the businessman who spent $750,000 on a baseball and had to close down a store on Times Square. It wasn't a great look. Tensions were high between Mark and Seth and all across the company. Mark remembers an incredibly regretful moment when in an argument with Seth, he turned to an employee Seth had hired and said, you see this guy you hired here? I predict he won't even be here in three months. That's what you do, hire and fire, hire and fire. It was their egos that were causing them to clash, and they realized that the solution to this problem, to save the business that they had put their heart and souls into, was to put their egos aside. 
Up until then, they were the only partners in the company. Two guys owned it in its entirety. This was not the case for Ralph Lauren or Calvin Klein. At that time, they looked into Nike and realized that nobody owned more than 5% of the company. Phil Knight, the founder and face of the company, only owned a small percentage. On October 27, 2009, Iconics paid $109 million for a 51% stake in Echo Unlimited. Two years earlier, that same company had bought out Rockaware. Their 51% stake in Echo made them the majority shareholder and they took full ownership of the company in 2013. Complex was spun off into a different company and Mark stepped away from the day-to-day -day operations of Echo Unlimited. Speaking about this moment, Mark said, We cheated death. Looking back on my career, this deal was my most unlikely, most surprising, most successful entrepreneurial coup. I saw it off my hand, but I saved my body. It's painful and it's bloody, but this is what you do. I was proud of it then, and I'm proud of it now. Make sure to subscribe for more.